Hello everyone, this is Paul Barnes from Hunter Lab, and thanks for reviewing today's webinar, which we're going to focus on the color science and color measurement focused on plant-based proteins. I think we know that plant-based proteins and those alternatives are certainly on the rise. We've seen global per capita meat consumption drop in the last decade, and more recently, disruptions of traditional meat processing have caused various supply issues globally. And some interesting stats is according to Nielsen, grocery store sales of alternate meat products rose over 250% in the nine weeks of the shutdown up until May 2nd. Very interesting. Faster than prior to the pandemic. So even more so, we're seeing acceleration in the interest of plant-based protein type products. And it's just not the meat alternatives either. You know, mentions of plant-based products in the literature and in the news have also been growing well over 200% globally in the last year or so as well. So we've seen a lot of interest from our current customers and new customers to measure the color of plant-based proteins and products of all type. So what I want to do today is take a look at some of the key topics in color measurement and talk about uh, what the industry is doing a little bit and what can be done to best measure color of the various plant-based proteins that are out there now. This slide deck is available from Hunter Lab. There'll be email uh, at the end of the talk as well as uh, on the IFT webinar section as well. So, so let's get going. I call this what Color is your plant-based protein, and again, I'm Paul from Hunter Lab. So why do food scientists even measure color? What is the overall reason for that? Well, a couple of a few key things that I really want you to walk away with. One is color can be an indicator of overall product quality, brand consistency, and of course, consumer acceptance. That's a big one. So quality, consumer acceptance, and brand consistency are why food scientists in general are measuring color. Also, from the business side, measuring color to make sure it's correct when it's going out the door helps prevent expensive returns and rejections that are possible. And overall, measuring color can be an overall indicator of any process variation throughout the production process. But in general, what our customers are doing and what food scientists are doing in general is trying to save money or cut cost, eliminate risk, or for strategic business objectives, adding color measurement into the analytical methods that the food laboratory is doing. And what color measurement can do is eliminate subjectivity and add objectivity in the, in the analysis of a food product. So another thing to talk about is where, where actually in the process do food scientists measure color? And it really is throughout the whole process, starting at incoming QC of the raw material, you know, R&D, and the development of new products, new colors, new color specifications, in-process inspection, and also final production testing. All throughout uh, the food production process and development process, color measurement can be used and is used. And color can be measured uh, in the QC laboratory, at the line, or even on the line. All different areas within the production process where color can be measured. All right. So, specifically to plant-based proteins, why? Why would the why why would you measure these? Why would a food scientist measure? Why would companies be interested in measuring this? And from our work in the industry, we found these are three big reasons. Number one is that the consumer is of course looking for a, and desiring a color and appearance to closely match that of the traditional product that they're evaluating. Pretty, pretty understandable. Number two, 
what does the product look like before and after cooking? Before cooking can be in the store when it's purchased, all the way through to after it's cooked and on the table for consumption. What does that product look like? And does it compare, how does it compare to the traditional products? And is it acceptable to that consumer? And going back actually to the start, the raw material uh, is a reason that you want to measure the color. Finding out the raw material, does the quality translate uh, and a good quality raw material will then transit, translate to a superior consumer product. But overall, my statement would probably be that food scientists and color scientists must look at all aspects of the plant protein products for optimal consumer acceptance. All right, what can be measured? What plant-based proteins can be measured? And my answer is that you can measure almost any of the protein plant products and raw materials, including the raw materials like soy isolates, protein flours, concentrates, natural colorants, ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. All those raw materials in various forms can be measured. Of course, all the meat alternatives can be measured as well. That's where a lot of the focus has been in the beef, the pork, the poultry, and seafood alternatives themselves. They, of course, the, the products themselves, the meat alternatives themselves can be, can be evaluated, as can different drinks and dairy alternatives. The protein beverages can be measured. Dairy alternatives that are out there that are protein-based. Protein bars, bakery products, nutritional products, all can be measured. Uh, the color can all be measured uh, with, with the technology that's available and the science that's available today. All right, so working with our current clients and our new customers, some specific challenges have developed in measuring the color of plant-based proteins. And so I'm going to share a few of these with you. Uh, they're, they're hard to measure. They're really difficult to measure. This has been the big challenge. And why are they difficult to measure? Because the products themselves have opaque and transparent characteristics, some at the same time, some individually, but opaque and transparent characteristics and the way they interact with the light can be a challenge. Light is transmitted and scattered through the samples, and that itself can be a challenge in what our clients have found. And color is observed in both the reflectance and transmittance method modes, and that in itself is another similar challenge to what our clients are seeing. But one of the big ones as well is that the sample structures and physical forms vary. And so measuring a granular powder type product on up through a, a meat product alternative all give a challenge to measuring color uh, in this industry now. And all that relays on or relies on the sample preparation and sample presentation. So those are the challenges that we've seen, and I'm going to try to tackle this in a couple different ways. First, we're going to look at what is colorimetry, color science itself. Okay? To help solve all this application challenge, I want to take a look first because that's something that gives us a tool that we can, can, can uh, utilize. So. The first thing I'm going to kind of say is, is when talking about uh, colorimetry in general, is that the governing body for, throughout the world is called the CIE. And that's an acronym for Commission Internationale d'Eclairage. And that is a governing body that's been in existence about 60 to 70 years, helping to define color measurement, color science, color, color science principles. And these are a couple of key things I really want you to walk away with and understand after the webinar today. And what does colorimetry, is CIE color, colorimetry actually do? And number one, it evaluates color as the human eye does. Evaluates color as the human eye. And it combines the illumination or the lighting of that product 
with the human observer and the human element into the color measurement. Really important parts. You know, measuring color as the human eye does or evaluating color as the human eye does and combining the illumination and human observer into the color measurement. Two big ones there. Colorimetry incorporates the entire visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum for analysis. A lot of the analytical tests that are done in a laboratory will be looked at at just a single wavelength, a single wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum, maybe in the UV, where there's a wavelength of maximum absorption. But it's really important to note that colorimetry incorporates the entire visible region for analysis, like your eye does, but it's really important to note that the instrumentation is, is operating in the visible region. And the other thing that colorimetry does is uses color scales to be able to quantify, describe, and communicate colors. We'll talk about some of those. And I want you to know that CIE colorimetry conforms to all the global standards here in the U.S., ASTM, and around the world for ISO specifications and others. So CIE colorimetry, again, been around for a long time and conforms to global standards. All right. So to define a color and understand a color and describe a color, in colorimetry, you need to think about three areas. You need to know what's happening to the product in three, three different areas. Number one is the light source. What light source or illuminating condition is the product being observed in? Number one. Number two is how is the sample itself? How is the object interacting with the light that strikes it? Okay. And number three is the observing situation. What is happening in the observing situation? And, and all three of those are, are allow us to describe and define a color. And I'm going to go into each one of these in, in some, uh, some, de some small detail right now, but important for the, the uh, webinar today to understand what these different things are. So the light source itself, number one. The light source affects the color of the object. I think we know that from our day-to-day -day lives, but light sources affect the color of the object. And so when you're evaluating color, you know, whether it's in the laboratory, your own QC-type laboratory at the line, or, or as it's ultimately viewed in the store, the light sources affect the color of the object. And what we do in colorimetry is simulate light sources with what are called illuminants. And illuminants represent the amount of energy for that given light source across the visible region. So the illuminant represents the amount of energy in the light source for, for within the visible region. Let me give you a couple examples of what uh, that are common illuminants that are, are helpful to know. Number one is the daylight illuminant there on the left, the daylight illuminant. And what you see is the daylight what's called the spectral power distribution of the daylight. And this is called D65 daylight. And you can see across the visible region from about 400 to 700, the daylight is very consistent, pretty much equal power, a little higher in the blue but, and drops slightly in the uh, red and orange area. But principally, it is consistent across all the, the visible region. It's so one of the reasons why daylight illuminants are used so prevalently is because of this, this diagram. It shows you there is equal amount of energy in the visible region for daylight illuminants, uh, all through the blue, on through the red. Now look at the middle one, the tungsten. This would be kind of home light or warm light. And look at the difference in the curve of that energy of, of the tungsten illuminant. From 400 to 700, you see a very small, small amount of energy in the blue area, yet it jumps significantly into the red area. This is why products that you have at home, or when you have tungsten-type illumination at home, it feels warmer. It actually, you sense a little bit more red. You see a little bit more red. It's because there's more red in the illuminating condition. 
very important to understand uh, as the product's being viewed, as is the illuminating condition on the right, fluorescent light, what's called cool white for fluorescent, F2 is what this is, it shows you what the product may be looking like in a store, right? The, the uh, power distribution for illuminant F2 is shown there. You see a big spike in the blue, you know, that gives you kind of that blue feeling that you have, that blue bluish feel that the illuminated condition has in a store drops down in the uh, in in the uh, in, in the uh, moving in towards the green and then jumps up a little bit in the green and yellow and drops again in the red but these show you these illuminates show you that the product can be actually affected and be seen differently in store light or in home light and in even in daylight so understanding what the illuminating condition is is important as you evaluate the color of your plant-based protein product. All right, the object. There's object from raw materials on through our, a, a burger on the grill. Okay? And so the object, I think what's important that one, I want to share with you today is that objects modify light in some way. Can basically do five things that when light strikes a, the sample or an object, light, about five different things can happen. One is light can be reflected. If a product is opaque, we see it as opaque, most of the light is reflected. Very common, common in food products, of course, okay? But also, light can be transmitted. If the product that you're looking at is transparent or somewhat translucent, light can actually be transmitted through it, and you can see color in the trans transmitted mode okay? if, if the product is somewhat translucent or is transparent. Objects or samples can also absorb light based on the different colorants that are in there. And when it absorbs certain wavelengths of light and reflects others, you see very specific colors in the products. It might be a yellow, it might be a red, and that's, and if you see a yellow, uh, what's happening is that all the other light wavelengths are being absorbed and only the yellow pretty much is being reflected. That's what's happening. Absorption kind of related to transmission and reflection as well. But scattering can happen as well when lights strike a project a, a, a product excuse me and the the light can be scattered which would cause a cloudiness or a haziness in your product so typically that's going to work and the last thing that light can do when it strikes a product is the light can actually fluoresce and we don't see fluoresce in food product fluorescing in food, pro, food products very often but you might see it in in packaging What's happening in fluorescence is that light from the UV source or any UV light is re-emitted in the visible region and it can change the color. It can make the product somewhat brighter. Uh, we don't see it again in food products typically, but sometimes we can see it in food packaging. Now, and what's happening at the object level was that the colorants in that object or that sample are selectively absorbing some wavelengths of light while reflecting or transmitting others. So that's kind of simply what's happening with the, with the object, very simply. Now I mentioned in CIE colorimetry how the human eye is involved. And so as we look at the, the observer portion of the, the uh, equation to define color. We have to think about the human eye and how the human eye works. And there's an eye and moving from left to right, left to right, the light comes through the lensing systems, through the through the cornea, through the lens and is focused on the back of the eye which has the retina and you've heard, all heard of the retina and then it, the stimulus goes down the optic nerve to the brain and we see color. So that's basically how the eye works. But going back a long time ago into some of the science you may remember, what's on that retina area, it's called the fovea region of the eye, but in that retina region are what are called rods and cones. You may remember those. Rods and cones are responsible for lightness and darkness that we see and color vision that we see. Rods and cones, they're concentrated in that part of the eye 
and rods give us the lightness and darkness and light and night vision, while the cones give us a color vision and function at higher light levels. But it's important to know in colorimetry that there are three types of cone sensitivities. They're red, green, and blue. This is important to know, red, green, and blue. They're different cones that give us these sensitivities. And what the CIE did, very quickly I'll, I'll give you the overview, is the CIE tried to define the average human observer. And through a variety of experiments done in the 19 30s and then repeated in the 1960s came up with what was called the standard observer. And there are two standard observers that have been published up since 1964 as well. These are used widely in the industry, the two degree observer and the 10 degree observer. For, for brevity's sake, these functions quantify the amount of red green and blue sensitivity in the average human observer. And these are incorporated into colorimetry to account for that third piece of the triangle, and that's how the observer sees color, a neutral observer sees color. So summarizing the three elements that we have to, to have in order to define and describe a color, we need to have the light source, a user-selected light source uh, that's defined typically by the CIE, the object that modifies the light in some way by measuring the reflectance and transmission typically for food-based products, and the observer represented by the CIE standard observer. So three elements to see color, light source object observer uh, are, are uh, summarized there. Quick, but uh, gives you an overview. Now, what are the color measurement technologies, or how does a color measurement instrument work? Okay. What a colorimeter does, or a color spectrophotometer does, in order to measure color, is described in this, in this diagram. The, and it relates directly back to what we just talked about in light source and observer. In a colorimeter or color measurement spectrophotometer, and those terms are really uh, synonymous, but the light source is typically going to be an LED light source or a xenon source that is going to give a uniform illumination onto the sample. LEDs and xenon are used because they're small and can be powered up very quickly, but those light sources then shine onto the sample or are focused onto the sample or object that you want to measure. And that sample has been optimized or prepared for the color measurement system that you're using. And then in this case, the light is reflecting off of that sample onto the spectrometer portion of the instrument that is breaking the light down. It's a diffraction grating that breaks the light down into the wavelengths, all the wavelengths of the visible region. You see them broken down. The colors of the visible region are seen there. And they, those are then taken to a diode array detector that very rapidly measures the amount of light reflected or transmitted at each of the visible region wavelengths. All right. Then that, all that data is taken into the data processor. The, the observer that I just mentioned, the 2 and 10 degree observer, are all calculated, and you come out with what are red, green, and blue amounts of light to describe that color. Red, green, and blue. The X value is the red, the Y value is the green, and the Z value is the blue. So that's what's going on in an instrument, and it all happens within a just, just a couple of seconds with a color measurement technology like this. So generically, that's what's happening. An example of, of this, a non-contact measurement on the left this, the instrument you see there, the picture there, is measuring the, the beef, the, the plant-based meat, excuse me, in the, in the package itself. It's not touching it, measuring it. And on the right, you see it a little bit closer. It can actually measure right in the, the product tray, the uh, plant-based product tray there. Uh, and so this is a non-contact. And there are other instruments where you can place the, this is an ingredient example where you can place an ingredient in a small petri dish, a small cup, or a glass 
sample cup right onto the instrument, press a button, and you get your measurement. In both cases, the measurements take only a few seconds to, to get your, your answer, get your color measurement value. So we light source object observer, we've seen a couple of basic instrument technologies, but how is color communicated, right? And what I mentioned CIE has done is that has helped develop along with other industries as well, but for, for uh, principally what we want to talk about in CIE colorimetry is that there are color scales that have been developed to correlate to how we perceive color and to simplify our understanding and allow us to improve our communication of color and also be able to understand what color differences are. Maybe color differences between the standard you're trying to achieve and the sample. Color scales have been developed to do these. Better correlate how we perceive color, help us in our understanding and communication color and understand color difference. And the scale that's used primarily within food science is called the LAB scale, the LAB color scale. And LAB scale relates directly to how the eye see color, sees color, but it also quantifies that color as well. And it does it by evaluating or is establishing and reporting three metrics. One is the L value, the other is the A value, and the other is the B value. So very simply, the LAB scale. The L value evaluates lightness and darkness. And it's on a scale from 0 to 100. Operates like those uh, rods that I mentioned previously, but the lightness and, and darkness is evaluated and reported in the L scale, with 100 being a complete black and 100, uh, 0 being a complete black and 100 being a complete white. So the scaling is 0 to 100, so you know you can understand how light or dark a product is with the L value from 0 to 100. 0 complete black, 100 a complete white. The A value can be positive or negative. The A, and the A defines redness or greenness. Positive A values are red or towards the red, and negative A values are green or towards the green. So where L is measuring just the lightness and darkness, A is measuring redness or greenness just like your cones are in your eye. Positive A values, again, are red, and negative A values are green. And the B value uh, just measures two other parameters, blueness or yellowness. Okay? That metric uh, is, is the positive B values are yellow, and the negative B values are blue. So any color can be described with the LAB scale, L, A, and B. And this is uh, the, the Hunter color, the LAB color space, the Hunter LAB color space that has been around since the mid-1950s, okay? Still used today, and the CIE also has a LAB color space as well, okay? And, and an example how you can describe color is that uh, with the LAB scale, again, I said all colors can be represented in the LAB color scale. Right? And this is an example of a, a tomato-based product, a red product, where the L value tends to be a little lower. Remember, on a 0 to 100 scale, it's down near and measured out at 22.4 is what this tomato product is. The A value, however, we know the A value, positive A values are red, so the A value is plus 34.1 in this case, and the B value Maybe a little bit higher than you might imagine, but the B value, a positive B value, is towards the yellow. So this tomato product not only is very red, it has yellow in it as well. But overall, the LAB color scale allows us to represent any color and describe any color uh, just using that scale. All right, so... That's kind of the overview of colorimetry. And the last part of the webinar today, I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of application related to color measurement of the plant-based protein, sampling, and best practices. I'm going to go back to the challenge that I proposed at the beginning of the webinar. 
that plant-based proteins are difficult to measure because opaque and tran because they have opaque and transparent characteristics. Light is transmitted and scattered and observed in reflectance and transmittance mode. Well, those are difficult. So the light interacting with the object or the product in this case, you know, can vary. It changes, it does various things, which is a challenge and difficulty that the industry has seen. And sample forms and structure can vary. The physical forms themselves can vary. And sample preparation and sample presentation is always a challenge, but can be worked out with specific methods. All right. So to kind of tell you the, the application of colorimetry is that color instrumentation can quantify any color in liquid or solid physical state. Any of the plant-based proteins can be measured, whatever physical state it is, to get a good measurement. And we pretty much have done that so far. Sample prep and sample presentation is optimized in colorimetry. Okay? We're, we usually talk about being consistent in the prep and being able to uh, consistently present the sample to the instrument for measurement. And doing so helps keep consistent uh, on the measurement and keeps consistent in the color values collected. The application of colorimetry also allows to replace subjective and visual methods or subjective visual methods with quantitative methods. And these me methods can be and these it can be recorded. Uh, the, the data themselves can be stored, can be reported, validated. And all throughout the process, data can be collected and, and provided with the, the color measurement system. And these are systems that are precise and accurate and versatile for many different type of products in the plant pro protein-based world. So lots of different applications, as we mentioned before, and typically colorimeters can do that job. Now, what are some of the best practices uh, that uh, we would recommend for measuring. Certainly choosing samples that are representative of the product in manufacturing. And that can be representative product of the raw material and representative of the product throughout manufacturing. And we want to choose samples that are representative. Not, not the best that you've ever made, but more representative of what the product is. That way, on a daily basis, you can evaluate the color. And are you is the trend correct? Are you within specification? All those things. You want to prepare the samples the same way each time. Clearly, preparing the sample and presenting the sample to the instrument in a, the same and repeatable math, me, method and, and manner is critical as a best practice for measuring, measuring the, the different types of products. And you may want to make multiple preparations. You may want to take averages depending on the product. You want to have to or need to average to get the best, the best measurement as well. But ultimately, in a specification, you are defining what the quality, the, the color quality relationship is. Okay? And that measurement system includes customer acceptance parameters, raw material inspection, maybe the process variation and process variables, and other business considerations. That's the entire color measurement system that you can implement. And we have many clients where the internal systems may be tighter than actually goes out to client-based. So I'm going to wrap it up now uh, in the webinar today. I appreciate your time in, in reviewing this today. And there's three resources that you can have. Number one is it today's and this week's IFT virtual expo. We have people at the at our booth virtually to talk about different types of products. And so that can be accessed, of course, through the IFTevent.org website. So IFT show virtual expo available now in those exhibit power hours. The Hunter Lab website is another rich content a website that you can go to to learn more about color measurements and applications that you're interested in. So that's www.hunterlab.com. And if you have any questions, you can email those to me at paul.barnes at hunterlab.com. There. So thanks for the time today. We appreciate it. And 
Uh, enjoy the IFT show this week. Thank you.